Thank you so much, Dave. And thanks to each of you. It is such a privilege to have this time with you this morning. And I'm so excited about our time together this week. Your customer service might be failing. All right, that, that sounds a bit provocative. I don't mean in the sense that your customers are running into bad experiences. I, I really doubt that's happening with any organization that's a part of this tugboat community. But across the broader landscape, the research is saying with, without doubt that in the vast majority of cases, vast majority of organizations, service is failing to live up to its potential. And that's what I encourage you and your teams to maybe take a fresh look at this week. What opportunities might exist there? I wanna share just a few notes on my background. It's kind of a precursor to some recommendations I wanna make that I hope are very practical for how you can do that um, with your teams. But there's some lessons I learned along the way that will hopefully add some context to these recommendations I wanna make. Um, I, uh, as Dave mentioned, grew up in Idaho, uh, rural Idaho. I went to college in California and my first real job, I guess you can talk, call it a real job, was working for a business communication systems company. So telecommunications and computer messaging, that sort of thing. I was the lowest uh, ranked employee and my job was to run cable. So I, I spent a lot of hours, hard hat on, this little light on my head, a lot of hours underneath floors, uh, corporate offices and hospitals and different buildings. It was hard work. I, I remember spider webs and creatures would scurry by just outside of flashlight range. There was that old saying, um, starting your career on the ground floor. Many of those days I just aspired to get back up to the ground floor. But I had some great mentors and they, they were a little rough around the edges, but they used terms like communications economy and service driven economy. And something just clicked with me. I became fascinated with it. Uh, I, I studied anything I could get my hands on from W. Edwards Deming and Philip B. Crosby, the quality gurus, and some of these names might, might be familiar to some. Uh, I followed business leaders, Debbie Fields and Jan Carlson. Jan Carlson wrote the book Moments of Truth in the mid-80s, and it really made an impression on me. He used to describe, he used to use examples like um, an airline tray. You, if you pull it down and there's a coffee stain, you're gonna wonder, hey, is that how they maintain the engines? So everything works together. I just became fascinated with that whole idea. Through a mutual contact, I met a guy by the name of Gordon McPherson. And Gordon's a real visionary, he was a real visionary in the customer service space. And we co-authored some articles together and, and developed a friendship. We ended up going into business together. So our company was the International Customer Management Institute. We were based in Annapolis, Maryland. And our sole focus was on helping organizations get the most out of their customer service operations. So I'm standing here with Gordon. Um, I'm in my mid twenties at that point. Most of my net worth was tied up in that suit, but the opportunities were coming in. And within a few years, Gordon wanted to pursue some other interests. We had a great few years working together. And I was getting these chances to work with organizations that I it would have been hard to even dream of at one point. The management team at Apple, um, USAA, Vanguard, the mutual fund was growing like crazy in those days. Uh, Qantas Airways and others. This is a picture of a seminar uh, for American Express. And there was a very visionary senior VP there who wanted her entire management team, whatever your role, you might be in HR or IT or anything, they, she wanted her entire management team to, to be aligned around some core customer service principles. So they're spread out all over. So they decided to rent this, uh, lease this studio in Dallas, Texas. Uh, they hired this news broadcaster who's sitting there with me and she moderated the, the Q&A. They ended up spending a million and a half dollars just on satellite transmission costs for things that we take for granted today. Uh, but, but it was a lot of fun. And, and, and I was inspired through that process by, by this visionary leader. And I could see the same principle with other leaders that, that was really at work driving their, their mindset and the things that they were putting in place. And this is, this is the first lesson I wanna mention. Everyone's in customer service. She used to say that all the time. Look, if you're not directly working with customers, you're supporting those who are. So it's a principle that's never left me. Well, there was a weird conversation that began to take shape in the 90s and run up to the dot-com boom and then bust. 
the idea was, hey, the, these cool new tools, web-based self-service and all that, you can fund them out of customer service investments because they're going to begin taking over those interactions. Now, we weren't seeing that just yet, uh, but that was the fashionable advice. You know, look at your budget. You're, you're going to see the, a bend in that demand curve. We weren't seeing that. We were seeing the internet, yeah, handle a lot of interactions and provide some really cool self-service options, but it was also growing the pie. It was creating new communication channels. So there was a gap that developed between what companies were providing in terms of service and what customers expected. And this was before social media. You can imagine how that would have looked, but, but these were some of the headlines of the day, you know, wasting your time and betrayed. And I've seen three cycles of this now. Uh, that, that was the first, and then smartphones and apps 10 years later, yeah, they're gonna take over these, these customer service interactions. And then AI and machine learning, that's kind of the discussion today. What's that gonna do? Is that gonna bend that demand curve? And another lesson really began to take shape in my own thinking. Uh, build plans and resources around reality. By all means, do everything you can to prevent work from happening in the first place, you know, through better products and a, a simpler business model, perhaps, all, of, all the steps you can take. Um, automate what you can. That's terrific, but be realistic about the ecosystem, the, the services that you still need uh, in place, human, technology, and otherwise. As they'd say here in Sun Valley, don't get too far out over your skis. It's not gonna, not gonna go well. Well, the backlash to bad service was one of the best things that ever could have happened for my company. And we, we uh, enjoyed this next leg of growth. We transitioned to a membership model. So we, we had everyone from Amazon.com to the federal government sitting there in the same room, sharing practices. It's very energizing. Our annual conference started out with a few dozen people and it soon enough became oversubscribed. We ended up with three conferences a year. And through our global partners, we were able to reach um, many other parts of the world. And I was traveling a lot, but I was getting these incredible opportunities to work with very different organizations in some cases, in very different markets, with, with very different cultures. And this next lesson really began to take shape in my own thinking. And, and this probably sounds so basic and easy, but I, I could see this unfold firsthand. Service must uniquely support your brand it can support and further your organization's personality. Make it yours. Be intentional with it. Um, Emirates is not USAA, is not Harley Davidson, is not Louis Vuitton or Qantas Airways. Make service work for you. And, and you and your team know how to do that best. So I did a very non-evergreen thing at that point. I'm gonna to have to ask your forgiveness for this, but I sold ICMI uh, to a, a company in London called Informa, a large business intelligence company. There are two things I would say, um, at the risk of sounding a little defensive on that move, but one is Tugboat wasn't around just yet. Uh, this was just before uh, Tugboat emerged and I didn't have you around to help me see all the options that existed. But here's the other thing. I know probably a number of you have been through mergers and acquisitions, probably far, I've been involved in a few, but you've, you've been involved in probably many of them, and you would know best. But I imagine in many of those cases, an acquisition takes an owner away from what they built and away from what they love. And in this case, I and, and my now smaller team was able to get back to really focusing on what we enjoy most. So I'm an advisor to an Informa today, and it, it, it's worked out really well. Where are we today in terms of opportunities and threats? And opportunities is a better way to look at them. But there are four things that are on the radar screen of every leadership team, at least any team that's paying attention. So I doubt there's gonna be a surprise here. But one is multiplying touch points. You can be a sole proprietor in a, a flower shop in a small town and there are a couple of dozen ways your customers wanna interact with you and they expect to be able to provide reviews and share stories with each other. How do you manage all that? And then of course, where is AI taking us? Where is machine learning going? Um, how can we harness those capabilities? Customer expectations. If they experience something great over here with this organization, they now know what's possible and they expect it with any of us uh, over here. 
raises the bar for everybody. And generations, I, I hear this all the time. We're serving the full breadth of, of today's generations and we're hiring younger generations into our employee base. Are there differences in perspective? And I wanna make just a, just a comment on that. This is a picture that went viral on social channels um, recently, and you may have seen this. Uh, these kids are in a museum. They're surrounded by this beautiful artwork, including that Rembrandt on that back wall, and they're on their phones. And you can imagine the backlash. My, my goodness, um, what, what's going on here? The problem was the picture didn't convey the full story. They were at the, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and they were on the museum's app doing an assignment they were given. They were fully, completely engaged. And I, I mentioned that to make a point. You know your customers best, and, and you'll run into all kinds of research, all kinds of advice that's based on these broad brush strokes and these really these stereotypes. Well, these customers want this, and, and those customers want that. You know your customers best. And I'll tell you, a, a customer from any generation is going to respond to service that's designed well, and it gives them choices, enable, enables them to get things done. And employees, and many of you know this so well, you, you, you've built this out firsthand. Employees from any generation are going to be engaged. They're going to represent your, your organization and your brand proudly if they've got a purpose, if they can see the connection between the work they do and how they're helping others. So build the services that are right for you. Let me suggest three questions that you can ask with your teams, and I encourage you to do so. To, to really shape service that's, that's right for you, right for your organization, and, and of course, especially right for your customers. And one is to simply ask, where are you? How, how do you view customer service now? How are you approaching it? And here's a simple framework you can use for this. So there are three levels on which service can create value. Level one is efficiency. You think of efficiency, you, you probably think of, well, can we prevent the unnecessary stuff? Uh, can we automate? You know, what can we do to efficiently handle what's there? And all that's necessary, that's, that's that base layer. A second level then is customer satisfaction and loyalty. So if you survey customers before and after service interactions, you'd see a bump in net promoter scores, customer satisfaction, or however you measure that. They'd be like, yeah, that, that, that went well, thank you. A third level is where fewer organizations are, are, are really pushing the envelope, but, but the opportunity is tremendous, and that's strategic value. And by strategic, I mean, what are we learning in the course of handling customer service interactions that can help us improve products and services and priorities across the board? The very powerful information, and even more so as surveys, you know, they, they kind of lose their punch because we're all so over-surveyed. But these are real, live interactions with intelligence that's there for the taking. Just a couple of simple examples. So Moen, the manufacturer of faucets and fixtures, they capture information on every interaction, and they use that to guide the build out of YouTube videos and the information they're posting online for contractors and do-it-yourselfers. Makes perfect sense. Uh, another example is the Australia Zoo in Queensland, Australia. It's just an amazing, really special organization. If you're ever down there and get a chance, go, go visit. But they, same thing, they look at every interaction and they use it to guide development of their app. They've got a great app. Um, they, they build out the koala experience and wombat encounter and other packages as they go along. So they, they stay relevant and fresh. Show me your metrics. Show me what you celebrate as an organization. And I, I have a pretty good idea of what level you're on. Is there more there to go after? Second question is, where are your customers in all of this? So what are their expectations? And, and here's a simple way to go at this. I mean, you get 10 people around a table, you get 10 different ideas of what customers expect. But here's a framework you can use. This is on a slide, and I know we posted the, the slides on the conference site, so you'll have this. I just wanna mention a couple of these. But there are 10 expectations that continue to surface. Be accessible, treat me courteously, tell me what to expect, and others. You'll, you'll see them on this slide. And, and here's the exercise. Get different roles around the table, virtual table it might be right now, and, and have them go through each of these expectations. 
So get someone from IT, you know, get someone from marketing, get someone from customer service, a few other areas. You'll know the team that, that might be a good mix for this and have them talk through each of these. So just a couple of examples, be accessible. I saw a biotech company go through this recently and one person pointed out that, hey, um, we've got these really cool consumer oriented products, but we're, they're kind of complex and we're losing people at certain parts of our website. And they could pinpoint right where, you know, someone's snooping around and, eh, I don't know, I don't get it, and they bail out. So someone in this exercise suggested, well, why don't we chat with them right there? The little pushback right away, you want to make, kind of make this like brainstorming, just keep the ideas going. But they didn't have the resources for a big chat team, but it took a modest amount of effort they were to find out to engage right where customers needed them. They just popped a little message, hey, we're here, can we help you? and their conversion rate immediately took a, a, a jump in the right direction. Another expectation is treat me courteously. And, and I would imagine when we think of being courteous, we think of those you know, social norms and we interact with each other. But your team will probably come up with various sorts of solutions. Technology often comes into the conversation. You know, what's that have to do with being courteous? Why not a text notification in this part of the process? Why not a verification that's, that's one way they've opted in, uh, they would want that, they, they, they would say, yeah, that's a courteous thing to do, thank you. So you'll see all sorts of very specific solutions emerge that are right for your customers and your organization. Here's a final question. What's your path forward? And I wanna suggest a few priorities in order. The first being eliminate Eliminate the most damaging frustrations. And any organization has them. I mean, this is an ongoing effort, ongoing process. But are there areas where you're just kind of missing it? Your employees will know, your customers will know. Are there areas where you just don't have service? There's a food company in Europe that sent out a tainted product. And it was, unbeknownst to them, of course, it was making people sick. This happened at the first part of a weekend their customer service area was closed and their customers were trying to ask, trying to find out what was going on, but they didn't have anywhere to go. No service was closed. So this festered for 48 hours. And by the time they knew what was happening, it was a full blown crisis. They later put a pencil to their direct out of pocket costs, uh, the damage to their brand. They came up with a number. They could have funded weekend customer service hours for over a hundred years. Are there gaps? Um, go after those. A second priority is speed and simplicity are sure winners. All the research is saying this. If you can make it faster and easier for your customers, uh, there's gonna be a lot of good benefit in that. And a final priority then is focus on strategic value. That drives everything. You're, you're really asking your entire customer base without putting it in these kind of words, but you're asking your entire customer base, hey, come along with us. Be a part of our research and development effort. And the, the, the power in that is just tremendous. The, the insight that you get on products and services and processes and competitors uh, and, and anything else at a strategic level, those things that matter most, very powerful. It's there for the taking. My wife, Kirsten, and I recently went to Greece. It was our second visit. We'd been uh, the first time 30 years uh, earlier. And we found some of those pictures from that first trip. So we had this corny idea of, well, let's try to match the pictures. So, so we got outfits, I actually found the same shoes, white socks, I don't know what I was thinking, white socks aren't a terrific idea for touring, but, but, but here's one of our attempts to match the picture. But we had a great trip. This was just before COVID shut things down. It was, it was our 30th anniversary and had a lot of time to think. And you know, 30 years is a blip in human history. But so much has changed. And of course, that was, that was something I, I thought a lot about. Wow, all the change in the last 30 years, amazing. But I also thought about the fact that things haven't changed that much in some really key areas. Your customers still need and expect service. They're still gonna respond favorably when it's designed well, when it gives them options and choices, when they can get things done. And service today still, and I would argue more than ever, is a powerful ally in your efforts to build your brand and to grow in coming months and years. So I encourage you and your teams to take a look at it, see what those opportunities are and build things out. It's an exciting process to watch. Thank you very much.